Well, good morning, everyone. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 16. We're going to be ending our series we've been in on fourth Sundays, a study in the life of Samson that we call Tragic Hero. And this is the last message in that sermon. Judges chapter 16. Turn me down a little bit, man. I'm ringing. Judges chapter 16. Telling the sermon today, the death of a hero. The death of a hero. We started off, our first um, sermon was the um, birth of a hero. And then we went to the marriage of a hero. And then we were the revenge of a hero. And this morning we are in the last sermon of the series called The Death of a Hero. When I was growing up, um, one of my favorite things to do was to watch cartoons. I love cartoons and I loved Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes was the bomb. Like, Bugs Bunny, he was the coolest because he always seemed like he was one step ahead of whoever was trying to get him, whether it was Elmer Fudd or if it was Yosemite Sam or if it was Marvin the Martian. No matter what was going on, he was always one step ahead of them and always winning. He always came out on top. Same thing with Roadrunner. You remember Roadrunner? He would always win. He would would be able to defy the laws of gravity, come out onto air, and Wile E. Coyote go onto the same air and fall. (laughs) And and I used to... Yes, praise God. Um, So I used to uh, watch this show, and I was was so uh, amazed at watching how Wiley Coyote, no matter how many times he had a great plan, he had all the, the things in place to do good, he always would lose. He would get tore up, he'd get blown up, he'd get ran over by a train, he would be, uh, there's so many things. I always thought Wiley Coyote, if he ever got saved, he would have such a testimony. <laughs> he'd just say, man, church, I should have been dead thousands of times, but God came through for me. I mean, that's, that's how I look at Wiley Coyote, but... The, the thing that those cartoons sort of um, instilled in me or taught me, maybe indirectly, was this idea that good guys always win and never lose. Good guys always win, never lose, because I always saw Bugs Bunny win. I always saw Road Winner win. I never saw them lose. They were always on top, and that's how you grew up. You watched cartoons. You, always saw, you want the good guys to always win. That's what happens. Could you imagine if Lion King ended and Scar won? Could you imagine as Simba gets his clock cleaned and thrown off a of pride rock and Timon and Pumbaa are made to be slaves and all the lions run away and then the, the, the camera begins to fade back and scars there laughing and then it fades to black and then the credits roll up, the circle of life. Everybody in the, in the room would say, no, no, this, this can't be. Because the good guys are always supposed to win and never lose. Never lose. Well, so far, we've been looking at the story of Samson. It's followed this narrative, hasn't it? Samson seems to always be winning. No matter what he does, he compromises. He does things God says not to do. He goes places God says not to go. And he still, no matter what happens, he always comes out on top as a winner. And so we look at that and we say, well, see, compromise might not be that bad of a thing. But I told you last sermon, compromise eventually catches up to you. It eventually catches up to you. And if you think that you can do whatever you want to do outside of the will of God in defiance to his laws and nothing will happen. This story hopefully will wake you up. Because if I were to put it in a worldly way, I would say today Samson's luck runs out. So let's look at Judges chapter 16. And I want to look at this story, this final story under three headings. One last victory, one last temptation, and one last confrontation. One last victory one last temptation, and one last confrontation. Judges chapter 16 and verse 1. One day when Samson went to 
Gaza, he saw he, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So let's look at one last victory. Why is Samson always seemingly in the wrong place at the wrong time? Sometimes people are in the wrong place at the wrong time because they're, they're shopping or they're just doing something innocent and they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Samson is at the wrong place at the wrong time because he's at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Gaza is a Philistine city. It's the capital Philistine city. You're an Israelite. What are you doing there? Now, of course, you could say he was on mission for God. Text doesn't say that. If you know Samson, he's very playful. He likes to play practical jokes. He's very arrogant. And so I think Samson was there just to have a good time to see what's up. Why would you go to the city that is crawling with people who want you dead? It's inhabited and owned by Philistines, and here you are just hanging out. And how many of you know when you're in the, the place you're not supposed to be, usually you get yourself into trouble. And what does he see? He sees a prostitute. He doesn't just see a prostitute. He sees her. He goes into her house. He doesn't just go into her house. He goes into her house, and they do stuff. So, Samson. You are called by God. You're a Nazarite. You have been set apart for God's work. And here you are in a Philistine city hanging out with a prostitute. Again, Samson just seems to be getting it wrong over and over and over. Well, it, somebody catches wind that he's in the city. And they say, what we're going to do, and maybe they didn't know where he was. They said, we're going to surround him and we're going to kill him at dawn. So their idea was when he comes out from the house and he's walking out of the city, that they'll get him. For some reason, he wakes up in the middle of the night, midnight. And he starts walking out the city. The way the cities were set up, there's no way for him to walk out of the city and people not notice. The way, where they had guards stationed, it would have been impossible for him to walk. People say, how did Samson get all the way out to the gates to pull them off? Some people say, well, God put them to sleep. Some people say it was just just, uh, luck. But what we know is that Samson, he walks out and he takes the gates of the city and he pulls them out, posts and all. Now, these gates were two stories high. He takes them out, posts and all, and the thing about these gates is that they weren't just wood. They would probably be metal as well because if an army came, they didn't want you to just set on fire your gates. So these heavy metal two-story gates, he takes them up, he puts them on his shoulder, and he just starts walking away with these gates. This, he has an amazing strength, doesn't he? If he, he would be the number one pick on all four uh, major sports teams. Anybody want to, a guy, you, that's Samson, you got to pick Samson. He picked up these gates, they probably weighed a lot, and it says he took them to the hill that overlooked Hebron. Most scholars, and depending on how you translate verse 3, they would have been about 15 miles away, possibly 40 miles away, for him to carry these gates and put them on the hill. Again, this this is Samson. I can see Samson as he puts this gate on the top of the hill. He's just laughing to himself. These poor Philistines. In fact, um, in in the ancient times, they did their work or their business at the city gate. And to possess the gates means that you had defeated your enemy. So here's Samson taking the gates off a capital city and putting it on a hill for them all to see. I could just see Samson just sitting there saying, I could go on doing this for years, terrorizing these people, thinking no one can touch me. I'm in the middle of their city, and they still can't get me. You guys ever heard that verse out of Proverbs that pride goes before destruction? and a haughty spirit before a fall. When firefighters are looking to see when a blaze is taking over a, a, a 
complex or a church or something, they look for what's called the point of origin. What's the point of origin? Where did this fire start? And if you look at the, the lives of many men and women, great men and women, and you say, what led to their fall? What led to their destruction? The point of origin you can often see is their pride is their self-sufficiency. If you look at pastors and ministers and great leaders in the world, when they have a great fall and you do a spiritual autopsy, what you will often see is that it started with pride, thinking I can continue to do what I'm doing and no one will find out. It will never come out. No one will ever know. And Samson, of course, he's been doing this for a long time, years, and nothing has happened, and Samson is sitting on the top of a hill just laughing. As the Gazites are just standing there, they have no gates. Thinking, what are we going to do about this guy? But as I said, Samson's luck is about to run out. This is how one writer put it. While the Heavenly Father is patient, he is not permissive. That is, he does not allow unacceptable behavior to continue indefinitely without discipline. So Samson is going to teach us that. So verse 4, after all this, verse 4, sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now this is the part of the story that if, if you're, even if you're not a Christian, you know this story. Operas have been written, paintings about Samson and Delilah. This is the most famous story in his life. And most of us know this story, but um, don't get confused. Don't think that the woman he's in love with is the same prostitute that was mentioned in verse 1. This is a totally different woman. And we know Samson. We're not sure if Delilah was a Philistine or if she was an Israelite who just kind of decided to side with the Philistines because it doesn't tell us. And scholars are not sure about what her name means. They think it might mean devotee. They think it might mean worshiper. Her name in Hebrew sounds like the word for night. And as you see in this passage, night is used over and over. So they think maybe the writer is foreshadowing this idea that Samson's life is full of darkness and that he cannot see at this time. We don't know what her name means, but we do know that Samson loves her. This is not like the other women. It's not a prostitute. Okay, when she calls him, the number comes up as bae. All right, not that one girl. <laughs> I, knew, I, knew some, <laughs> I knew somebody one time, they had a bad relationship with their uh, stepmother. So whenever they called, the, the ringtone would be the ringtone for Jaws. <laughs> I always thought that was funny. But anyway, they're going steady. He loves her. This is not a one-night stand. This is a serious relationship. And so it says, he loves her. Her name was Delilah. Verse 5, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, "Um, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. Now, I don't know if you notice that the Philistines have switched their their approach because the first time, remember the, the... The first wife said, you better tell us or we'll kill you. This time they're like, you know what? She could say, oh, you're going to hurt me? I'll just tell my husband and then he'll hurt you. So they decide to do what everybody knows what works is money. We'll give you a bunch of money. And the amount of money that they're giving her would have been enough for 10 years of her life. So here's, here's, they're not coming and saying, we're going to, we're going to kill you. They say, we'll give you money. And so, verse 6. Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Now, that's just, I mean, you're just laying there with your wife at night. She goes, hey, tell me, how can I tie you up and hand you over to people to kill you? Like, how, how can that happen? And here's, here's Samson answer, verse 7. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs, that's bowstrings, by the way, just in case you're like, that's weird. That's, that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Well, that's not true. But she believes it. Verse 8, then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had, not, that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called 
to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now. Tell me how you can be tied. I'm going to come back to this, but, but bro, like, so people say, God, show me a sign. If she's the right one for me, like, this is, he said, verse 11, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become weak as any other man. Now, you should know this shouldn't work because in chapter 15, remember, they tied him with new ropes. He just broke those off, but she, apparently she doesn't know that story. <laughs> so, verse 12, Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, until now, you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head onto the fabric on the loom and tighten it with the pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with the pin. Again, she said to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin in the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say, I love you? See, this has been, this has been going on for a long time. When you won't confide in me. I'm your boo. You're supposed to tell me everything. (laughs) This is the third time. You have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. Verse 16, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. I'll come back to that. Verse 17. He told her everything. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Told her the truth. Now, I don't know if you noticed in the beginning, he's telling her lies, but then he starts to get even closer and closer. He starts talking about his hair. Mm-hmm. Put my hair in the loom. So he's, his defenses are starting to get broken down, and now in this end, he's told her everything. Yeah. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair. That's so interesting to me. How did that conversation go? As you talk to someone to say, I, she goes to the man and says, I have a job for you. You're a barber, right? Yeah, I'm a barber. What do you, what do you want me to do? I need you to cut somebody's hair. Okay, cool. Whose hair is it? It's Samson. You mean the guy who's been killing all the Philistines and terrorizing our country the last few years? And him? Yeah, he's my boyfriend. We're cool. But I just need you to cut off his hair because... We're going to tie him up and we're going to hand him over. So it's, we're, I'm basically betraying him. Can you help me? And apparently this guy says, oh, okay. But what, like, but what, if, what if he wakes up? And Delilah, Delilah probably said, well, if he wakes up, I cannot guarantee your safety. But I mean, one person said it's like taking uh, clippers and, and trying to clip the toenails of a grizzly bear while he's asleep. Who would do that? But apparently this man, I don't know how much money she offered him, but he said, I'll I'll go and shave off the braids of his hair. And so he did that and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Verse 20, then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. 
but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. So we saw one last victory. Now this, this next section that we just read, one last temptation. Samson looked at his strength like a toy to be played with rather than a calling to be fulfilled. He thought, I'll just do as I've done before. I think the most depressing verse is verse 20. Look at it again. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. I don't know if you notice as we've been reading that every time Samson did a great feat of strength or he defeated enemies, it says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, would come upon him, literally rush upon him. And so the secret or the source of Samson's strength was not his hair, but God. But his hair was a representation of his connection and his consecration and separation to God. And so what Samson was doing by letting his hair be cut, he was essentially saying, I'm leaving you, God. I'm leaving you. But he never thought in a million years that God would actually leave him. I wonder if you woke up tomorrow and God wasn't with you, would you even notice? I'll never forget a couple years ago, one of my dad's good friends in the ministry and best friends just in life, Dr. Larry Ellis, came and spoke at our um, pastor and wife appreciation. He told a story where he said he walked one day into the unemployment office and in line he saw the Holy Spirit and he walked up and said Holy Spirit is that you? Third person of the Trinity? The paraclete? Is that you? He said yeah Ellis it's me. So what are you doing in the unemployment office? And he said well church doesn't need me anymore. They can do ministry in their own energy. And so I'm here in the unemployment office and looking for a job. And the sad thing is, he said, is they don't even miss me. I never forgot that story. Have we begun to do ministry, preaching, teaching, singing without the power of the Holy Spirit? You might say, well, what do you mean? Because I thought when we get saved, the Holy Spirit is given to us as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come we can't lose him he's given to us and that's true but in the old testament the holy spirit was given at times and moments to empower for ministry but in the new testament the parallel to that is empowerment for ministry you can be filled with the spirit you can have the holy spirit in your life and not be walking in his power and this happens all the time we call you ever heard a minister preach and you say man i something's not right Everything he said was true. He was teaching what the Bible says, but there's something that's missing. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we not plugged into the electrical socket of the power of God and instead doing ministry in our own strength? You know, we think about an electric shaver is the ones that are battery powered. Eventually, the batteries run out, and they're not as strong. But when you plug it up, it has power, and it's pretty much eternal unless you don't pay your, your bill. So these, these electric shavers, when they're plugged into a power source, they have power, and they have power for a long periods of time. And so many Christians are battery powered. They're trying to go off their own strength, and they're not connected to the electrical current of God's divine strength. And so when you're trying to do ministry, say, I'm so burnt out, I'm so tired, it's because you're not being plugged into God and doing it in his power. Have you seen the the ministry and the things that the the, the apostles did? And half the time, they didn't have to do anything crazy. They would just pray. Stuff would happen. They would just stand and preach. People would start coming forward to get saved. And I, I, I think about my ministry. I think about our church ministry. I say, Lord, I want us to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like Samson was. But here's the thing. Just because we're saved, just because we love the Bible, doesn't mean that God will always 
bless us the way he could. Because if we walk in compromise, if we walk away from what he says we are to do, then we cannot expect his blessing. God gave Samson power not for Samson's own pleasure and not for his own enjoyment. God gave him that for his own pleasure and for his will to be done. It's like giving your child 20 bucks and say, I want you to go to the store and buy me Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And the child says, okay. And then they go out, and their friends are standing around, and they say, what are you guys? I got $20. Like, why? Oh, for fun and for pleasure and for a good time. Say, no, that's not why that $20 was given to you. That $20 was given to you so that you could fulfill the will of another, namely your mom, who said, get me some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And the talents and the gifts and the power and the strength that God has given to you is not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of God and his people. And if you play with that like Samson did, you will find yourself with your eyes gouged out. Now, here's the the, the elephant in the room. How could Samson be so stupid? I mean, I know a lot of us say, oh, Samson, because if that were me, the very first time, I would have been, girl, bye, Felicia, bye. I would not, I, <laughs> bye, Felicia, I ain't dealing with you. But this is, Sam, and here's the thing. Um, lust, women, that can have a very, very profound influence on you. And if you look at Samson's story, you think, oh, this guy's an idiot. He would never do that. And I look at that all the time, but I don't think you realize just how similar you and I are to Samson. Look at verse 16. Look what he says. With such nagging, she, I told you I was coming back. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Look, the NASB translation, the NASB translation is a, is a more literal translation, and this is what that translation says. It's, it's hilarious. It says, it came, and when it came about, when she pressed him daily, and with her word, she urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. (laughs) You are annoying my soul. (laughs) Husbands, just try that. When the next time your wife is on this, babe, you are annoying my soul. I'm not going to do it. You should. (laughs) Now, what is it? Now, think about it. How many guys decide to sleep with a woman or have an affair the very first time she asks? No, it's it's not the first time. In fact, one study says that 85% of affairs happen in the workplace. There's all this time, 40 hours a week perhaps, you spending with this same person. There's secret texts, secret emails, secret lunches that in, eventually end up in a secret affair. But it wasn't the first time. This, no random girl walks up to you and says, hey, we should have an affair. And you say, okay. <laughs> it happens gradually. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, it's a, it's a book where he's um, imagining a, a senior demon talking to a junior demon, and he's training him in the ways of of demondom, I guess. And so so he's trying to show him, this is how you deal with Christians. Let me show you how you can trick them, how you can deal with them. And in one occasion, this is what he said to him. He wrote this, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. He's telling them, hey, man, don't just gently lead them to hell. If you do too much movement, they'll get alarmed. What's going on? (laughs) This is not my bus. (laughs) No signposts, no milestones. Just let them go straight down slowly. And we know this is true, don't we? How did you how did you gain weight? You didn't go to BJ's. 
<laughs> once, and it was just, oh man, I just gained all the It was over, not days. <laughs> it wasn't weeks. It maybe not even been months. Years. Slow. Gradual. And it's true that the same consistency and faithfulness that you show to eating that way, you're going to have to show that same consistency and faithfulness to eating good to get it off. Amen. And people, you know, they go to a gym for a week and like, I've only lost 0.4 pounds. <laughs> this is stupid. You didn't gain it in a week. You're not going to lose it in a week, but it's gradual. And you would never think a cookie. So it's just a cookie, but a cookie over five years. And here's, here's what I want you to, to see. Satan is not trying to get you today. He's not trying to get you today. He's trying to get you five weeks from now. If all he can do is just put something in your mind today. Oh, yeah, she resisted today, but she'll be back. As a one writer put it, he said, Satan ruins men by rocking them asleep. Flattering them into a good opinion of their own safety and so bringing them to mind nothing and fear nothing. And then he robs them of their strength and honor and leads them captive to his will. It's been said, Satan never comes to us dragging the chains that will enslave us. When we were teaching in uh, 2020, um, we were doing a series on friendships. And I wanted to, to, to... say to them, this friendships are one of the most important aspects of your life, and this was kind of sort of the, the, the banner over which we did the series, and it's that friends determine the direction and the quality of your life. Yeah. Friends determine the direction and the quality of your life. And so what I told them was, you need to beware of friends that you have that slowly chip away at your convictions. Yeah. Because it's not that person that you're with for one day that's going to make a difference. It's hanging out with your friends. In fact, most of us can think about times in our life when we had bad situations or things that we regret. Usually it's with our friends that we were doing those things. In Hebrews 2.1, it says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. And then he says this, So that we do not drift away. Drifting is slow. It's not quick. So if you allow sin to keep nagging and prodding you and pressing you, eventually you'll cave in. John Owen said it this way, and I love it. He said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. It's a kill or be killed situation. And Samson, when he was confronted with this situation, the very first time he should have said, hey, you know, I feel like you're trying to kill me. So I need you to stop asking me this question. I'm committed to God. I'm not telling you the secret of my strength. Go sit down somewhere. That's what he should have done. He he should have left and said, I'm going back to my dad's house because this is you clearly, you clearly have it in for me. But isn't that true that we just allow sin and temptation to just hang around and keep asking us? And this is what it says in Proverbs, that it's the slow drip, the nagging, the slow drip. Uh And do you know that the hard rock can be eventually um, eroded away by soft water just over time? And if you you live in in a lifestyle of sin, if you're living with someone you're not married to, if you are in a relationship you know you're not supposed to be in. If you're in a business relationship, you know you're not supposed to be in. And I know, you'll get in there and you say, oh, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I won't let them influence me. The Bible says that bad company corrupts good character. You're not that strong. I had friends who tell me, I can lay in the bed with my girlfriend, we don't, I'm not tempted at all. You are a liar. <laughs> No, I, I'm not stupid. You, you, that's not, no, no. But don't look at Samson and say, oh, look at him. He's so stupid because we do the exact same thing. The exact same thing. And then we come to the pastor, I don't know what happened. He said, I can tell you what happened. You kept getting nagged and prodded and urged, and you just, you caved in. We're not that strong. We need God, and we need common sense. Okay. 
The last confrontation, and this is sort of the end. And, and look again, verse 21. Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles just in case. They set him to grinding in the prison, but it, the hair on his head began to grow after it had been shaved. I don't know if you realize that the place of his pleasure has now become his prison. They took him back to the very place that he was just carrying the gates off and hanging out with a prostitute. Now he's there as a prisoner. They gouge his eyes out. This is very common in the ancient world. Normally they take a hot iron and they would stick it in your eye and then scoop out whatever was left. And that sin, what sin does to you is worse than that. Amen. Wages of sin is death. Verse 23, the last confrontation. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. As stupid and, and, and dumb as Samson has been, I feel sorry for him in this moment. He's probably in the prison. He can hear them worshiping and praising and celebrating, saying their God has done it. And he doesn't have the strength that he once had to, in, in previously, he probably would have just killed everyone in there. But now he has no power, no strength. When he, uh, verse 25, no, 26. Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there are about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Now they don't know what it means that him performing. He could have been, some people say, uh, doing feats of strength. I don't think he had his strength at the time. So they believe possibly they were poking him, prodding him, treating him like a circus animal as they laughed as, oh, the great Samson. And this was funny to them. Verse 28, then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. O God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might And down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel for 20 years. Can you imagine being in this temple of Dagon hearing people worship and praise your God their God and you know that you serve the one true God he's he's literally at his weakest point but when you and I are at our weakest point we can pray this is what Samson does and I want you again look at his prayer as he's in this moment he prays verse 28 and Samson prayed to the Lord O sovereign Lord Sovereign Lord, remember me. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. This lets us know that Samson, he knew who God was. He was not ignorant. It wasn't like Samson was out there running around doing what he wanted to do and he just wasn't theologically informed. He knew who God was. He knew he was sovereign. And yet he was still doing these sort of compromising things. But in this moment, he prays to God for his strength. And he says, Lord, remember me. To say remember is not a way of saying, Lord, literally remember me. Remember when the thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom? To remember means to act on behalf of. He's saying, he's not saying, 
just remember that I'm here or I'm there. He's saying, I want you to, to do something for me, strengthen me. But even as Samson is praying that God would be sovereign and he's praying for the strength, I want you to notice that he is still consumed by revenge and his pride. Look what he says. Oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. Oh, God, please remember me. He keeps talking about himself, me, me, just once more, and let me with one blow get revenge again on the Philistines. Why? For my two eyes. He doesn't come to God and say, God, I want your glory. I hear these people praising a demon God. I want you to come in here and throw your weight around and show them that you're really God. That's not what he prays. He's not praying for the glory of God. He's not praying for the good of his people. My two eyes. What's your prayer life like? When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to start with God and then go to ourselves. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praise God, honor him, bless him, pray that his name would be praised, his name would be treasured, that his glory would fill the earth. Pray his kingdom and his will would be done. My fear is that our prayers too often hover around ourselves and our own needs. Not to say we shouldn't pray for our needs because he says we should. And you know how much prayer you really need more than anybody else. But we should make the glory of God our major aim. And what ends up happening is when you make the glory of God your major aim, God takes care of everything else. And so here's Samson. He's praying and, and, and praying that God will give him revenge. And the old folks used to say that God will make a way out of no way. And I think it's interesting here that there's seemingly no way out of this situation. Samson is seen to have lost Game over. They're singing and praising. They're doing the Cupid shuffle on the side. Everybody's just consumed, thinking we have won. And the Philistines should have known better. Do you remember? There's actually a story earlier when the the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, and they took it and they put it in the temple of the god Dagon. And they took the Ark in there and they left it in the temple. And the next morning, the god Dagon was on the floor. They said, "Oh, this, this is not good." So they put him back up. Then they went to bed the next night. Dagon was on the ground again, and this time his hands and feet were off. And then they started saying, you know what? We need to get this ark out of here because people started getting boils and issues, and so they sent it to another city. That city started getting sick. So they said, send it on to the next city. And they said, don't send it to us. Send it back to Israel. As if God was saying, you're not going to take my holy things and just put them in the temple of a demon God. And they thought, we can just take God's things or even God's people, his anointed one, you think you're going to bring Samson into this place and I'm not going to do anything? No, no, no. God starts to throw his weight around. And this is what happens. He puts his hands on the pillars and pushes and 3,000 people are there. It doesn't tell him how many of them died, but it said that in his death, more people died than than his entire life of, of ministry. At least over 1,500 people. And what this teaches us is that God is so committed to his plan that he can take a bald, blind, defeated man and kill his enemies. And whether you like it or not, Samson, you will fulfill my plan and purpose for you. And in his defeat, he does more than when he was alive. And only God could do that. We started with a woman who was barren being given a a promise of a child who would do great things for God. But we end up with Samson being buried under the rubble of a temple. Tragic story, and he accomplishes more for God dead than alive. So what do you think about Samson? I know there's a lot to think about in process, but what, what would you think about Samson? This is, he's the last judge in this book, but his name pops up somewhere else. In Hebrews chapter 11, you don't have to turn there, but 
Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith. It's the place where the great men and women of the faith are enshrined. And look at their faith. Look at how great they are. And listen to this in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 32. The writer says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson. How did Samson's name get in there? How did this prideful, lustful, angry, compromising man make it into this museum? How? Now, you could ask, you could ask this question about everybody in there. <laughs> because there's no one who seeks God. There's no one who does good. All have turned away. And so Samson is not some crazy person in there. Oh, man, how did he get in here? Everybody in there is messed up. And if you're thinking, how did Samson get in there? I would ask, how did you get in here? Because we've been called into God's family. Called into his family as his sons and as his daughters. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. This is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here is the major encouragement from the life of Samson. God can still use sinful servants. God uses those who are far from perfect. But I want to say this, and I said it in the previous sermon. Don't aim for usefulness. Aim for obedience. Samson was greatly used by God, but he wasn't obedient to him. And it's far better to be used by God and pleasing to him rather than to be used by him and yet living in contradiction to his word. But I love in verse 22 how it says, while he's in the prison, his hair on his head began to grow back. God's mercy and God's grace. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard you try, we can never, we can never reach God's standard. We need another to come in our place. And we've always ended these sermons looking not at Samson, but looking at Jesus. And I want you to note the similarities. Number one, Jesus was betrayed for money, just like Samson was betrayed for money. Secondly, he was handed over to his enemies to be mocked and tortured, just like Samson. Like Samson, he dies with his arms outstretched. And then number four, through his death, though it looked like a defeat, he was really a defeat of the enemy. But Jesus' death is so much greater because Samson, it says in the beginning that he would begin the deliverance of his people, but Christ would be the one who would complete it. On the cross, he said, tetelestai, the debt has been paid in full. Christ has completed the work. Listen to Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus is not dead at the bottom of rubble from a temple. He is sitting at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning and waiting to come and get his people, his bride. He's alive, and he's coming back to be with us forever. And he's the one that we look to because he's the real hero. Let's pray.